Well, hello, everybody. We are on chapter 11 right now. And chapter 11 is where we're going to start on the nervous system. And of course, the nervous system is us. So basically, our nervous system comprises both the conscious and unconscious part of our, I guess you can say, um, um, uh, body control system. Now, what, now what's interesting is that our consciousness is really only a small part of our of our brain. The majority of our brain is is responsible for subconscious processes. But anyways, we're going to learn quite a bit about it today, and we're going to start with talking about. Let's see where I am on the outline. Nervous system organization. So, system just refers to any kind of process where nerves communicate with the brain or nerves communicate with the rest of the body. It is a very well honed system. Okay, so if you look here, we're going to do a nervous system organization. You're going to see that we start with the nervous system. So this is the nervous system as a, as a whole. That's right, nervous system. And we have what's called the central nervous system. And this is comprised of two things here. Comprised of two things. The brain and the spinal cord. Now, on the other hand, we have something called the, the peripheral nervous system. Peripheral. And this comprises both what we call the somatic. And the somatic is anything that involves movement of skeletal muscles. Somatic is anything that gives gives information to the, the skeletal muscles to contract. And also we have the autonomic. Auto means self, of course, autonomic. And the autonomic is going to be separated into two categories, two further categories. Sympathetic, which many of you have heard the term fight or flight response and parasympathetic. Many of you have heard the term rest and digest. And more or less, it just depends on whether your body thinks that it needs to fight and run from a grizzly bear, or if it's, or if it's okay just to eat, restore energy, uh, digest food, and excrete wastes. Because of course, if you are really running from a grizzly bear, which I hope happens to none of you, including myself, then you definitely do. You definitely do not want to have a sudden urge to stop on the side of the uh, the road and uh, urinate. Now, neurons are going to be the main. Um, well, they are what they are the cells that comprise the nervous system. And anyways, there's three there's three factors here. And the one is extreme longevity. Um, nerves basically last you, well, not basically, they, they, they more or less last you depending on the, on the nerve. And that's not longevity. I don't know what it's called. Long jevity. There you go. I have no idea what I, what I wrote. But anyways, these, these last the lifetime of the individual. And they work basically very close to the day that you were, you, were, you were born. Of course, over time, the synaptic signaling is not going to become as efficient. Which is why as people get older, the, refle the reflexes slow down because it isn't quite good at transmitting information like it did when it was when you were younger or if you are, are, if you are younger, definitely cherish it. Next is a term that we call 
amitotic. And this means that once you have a neuron, you have a, a neuron. It does not undergo mitosis. And if you remember your, your basic bio, um, mitosis is when two cell or, or, or one cell divides into two identical cells that we call daughter cells. Nerves do not do, not do this. Neurons do not reach, regenerate. Now, some of you may have said, well, wait a second, I had a surgery done and my, uh, my face was numb and then a couple months later, feeling restored. Um, nerves can repair themselves, but they cannot make new ones via mitosis. And last one is exceptionally high um, metabolic rate. This does basically means that they require a high amount of glucose and oxygen. If not, they just turn off, which is why, why, why people that are what we call um, hypoglycemic means that there's not enough glucose in your, in your blood. And if there's not enough glucose in your blood, there's not enough to, to get into your brain and the neurons will not function basically at all. Um, if, it, if it gets to a point where there's, there's not enough blood, blood glucose, same with oxygen. That's why white people that are even a, 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 a little bit oxygen deprived lose, uh, lose consciousness. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the parts and function of a neuron. And I'm gonna use a motor neuron as our template here because it's easiest to draw and easiest to learn. Parts of a neuron. Okay, so we, so we start with, start with this part here. And this is called the dendrite. And what dendrites do is that they are actually, they receive information from other neurons. So this receives this, the signal. And now this part here is actually the living part of the cell. And we call this the we call this the cell body. Now, the neuron is going to have a long, look, kind of looks like a tunnel. We call this the axon. The axon is what transmits the electrical signal. Then over here, we have the end of the axon. We call this the axon terminal or terminal axon. And at the end of here, neurotransmitter is going to be released into the synaptic space, terminal axon. Similar to what we talked about last, last chapter. Um, and now a synapse is a, is a space between a neuron and either a tissue or another neuron. So to give you an example, I'll draw for you the end of an axon terminal. So this is a terminal axon. Terminal axon. And then this is going to be the dendrite of, of, a, of, of a opposing neuron. This is going to be the dendrite. Now we call this neuron, we call this the post meaning after, synaptic meaning synapse, neuron. We call this up here, we call this the presynaptic neuron. Presynaptic neuron, meaning before the synapse. We call this here the synaptic cleft or the, or the synapse. Synaptic cleft as a, or in synapse. 
Now, you'll see here on the study guide, or the outline I put down, neurons act as a valve. Now, a valve is anything that ensures one-way flow. Once again, a valve is anything that ensures one-way flow. And what happens is that neurotransmitters, they diffuse from a high concentration, as we know, to a low concentration, so they can't go backwards. And then they bind to receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. So basically what happens is that signals, as we talked about briefly in uh, the previous chapter, signals are going to be released from the presynaptic neuron. These are neurotransmitters. They're going to bind with the receptors on the postsynaptic neuron. That's how they act as a one way valve. Now, neurons also transport things. So if you need to write this down, you can always pause the, the video. So neurons also transport things. We call this neuronal transport. Probably not going to be super surprising to you. So now that we've talked about the terms, I don't really need to go over this too often, too much more. So now we're gonna talk about neuronal transports. Now what's gonna happen is that neurons their job is to make signal molecules called neurotransmitters. And the goal is, is that they're trying to get these neurotransmitters to the axon terminal where they can be released into the synapse. And there are different ways for this to happen. So there's three types of uh, neuronal transport. The first is called slow integrate, slow Anterograde. Antero means forward. Now, what, what this is, is, is that proteins and large support structures move from cell body move from cell body to terminal axon. Now, these are mainly things that are very, uh, that are more of support structures. Um, proteins that are res responsible for ensuring proper functioning of the axon, um, support structures in the axon terminal, so these are mainly larger things that help support the proper functioning of the neuron. Now the next one is called fast anterograde. And it's called fast anterograde because it's easier to move something small than something large. So fast anterograde is quicker movement. And as I said, once again, this is from the cell body to, to the axon terminal. And fast anterograde is mainly neurotransmitters. So keep in mind, everything is made in the cell body because the cell body is actually the living part of the cell. And a neuron, make no mistake, it may look cool, but it is a cell. Okay, now on the other hand, sometimes the neuron's going to take back things to recycle. We call this retrograde. Retro is to go back. And this is materials sent back to the cell body for recycling. So more or less, these are things like old proteins, um, neurotransmitters, and they are going to be to be used to make new structures. Okay, now we're going to talk about some cells called called glial cells. And let's go ahead and talk about them. Now, we're going to talk about ones that are in the cent in the central nervous system first. Well, actually, let's just go into in the order and. A lot of this is not going to make a lot of sense now, but it, but it will later. 
So glial cells are support structures. Really, the, ma the majority of cells in our, in our brain, for example, they're actually not neurons, they're glial cells. So glial cells help to support the function of neurons. And the first one we're going to talk about is something called a satellite cell. In satellite cells, they are going to help form something called ganglia. Now, what are, are ganglia? Well, basically, they are regions. Well, not, not regions. They are, are, are structures like this, kind of like a bulb. And what happens is that one neuron, one neuron is going to synapse with as many as 30 other neurons. It's a terrible example, but think of it like a mother cat feeding a bunch of baby cats. Is you have one, one source of information, but many are going to receive it. So you're going to have up to 30 other neurons that are, are, are going to receive the signal. The side of this happens at the ganglia, and this is comprised of satellite cells. It's a process called divergence, which we'll talk about um, either in this chapter or a different one. The next one is called a swan cell, swan cell. So swan cell. And what these do is that they are going to form what's called myelination. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna draw a, a neuron here. So again, we have the dendrites then we have the axon, then we have the axon terminal. And, and, it, and don't get me wrong, information travels very fast down the axon terminal, but it could happen faster if we have something that can increase the speed of the trans transmission. And basically some neurons, they have these cells on them in red, I'll say, called a swan cell. And the, and the swan cell is going to, to produce kind of a fatty covering called myelin, like this. And what this does is it's going to actually increase the speed of transmission. So this, so this myelin is a, as I said, a fatty covering that kind of wraps around the axon. And its job is to increase speed of transmission. Now, the next thing is going to be called an astrocyte. And astrocytes, they're only found in the central nervous system. So we have astrocytes, they are only found in the central nervous system. What they do is that, and it's really hard to really classify what an astrocyte does because they, because they, they, they do so much. Astro stands for star-like. So it supports First, it helps to form the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is a highly selective barrier that only allows certain things to diffuse into the brain and vice, vice versa. It also supports neuron communication, and we're not entirely sure how. Uh, the book has some, some ideas about it. Neuron communication. So basically they are support structures. So if I'm gonna draw here a neuron, okay, then, then the astrocyte might be like this, because as I said, it's a star-like -like, um, structure going to kind of surround the neuron, help to bolster it, help to help it to do its job, and also helps to form the blood-brain barrier. So like, if this is the cells that make up blood, blood vessels, like so. 
what the astrocytes do is they kind of, uh, they have these foot-like processes and they kind of bolster the cell or the cells that make up the blood, blood vessels, more or less, more or less preventing things from getting in, into the brain. Now, the next thing is called a microglia. So, once again, so this supports, but it's only found in the CNS. Same with this thing called a glial cell. No, what am I saying? Microglia. And microglia, they are a form of macrophage. So they are a form of macrophage. That um, that acts in the central nervous system. So what it does is it eats debris, mainly, and any kind of, um, if, if present, a pathogen. But thankfully, pathogens uh, do not get into the brain, other than something like meningitis. But mainly, its job is to is to is to uh, eat debris. Okay, next is something called an ependymal cell. So what ependymal cells do what they do is is that they are going to um, surround certain parts of the of the brain that secretes what we call cerebrospinal fluid or C S F. We'll talk about that later. Okay, and next is something called an oligodendocyte. And I'm going to go through this quickly. Oligodendocyte. And what these do is that they are actually going to act, so they are going to surround neurons. in the CNS and secrete myelin. So more or less, they do the same exact job as, as swan cells do, except swan cells are only in the peripheral nervous system and illegal dendrocytes are only in the central nervous system. But they both basically do the same job. Okay, so now we are going to talk about a neuron reflex arc. One second here. Mm. Okay, cool. We're going to talk about a neuron reflex arc. So, really, how it works is that things are going to be fed to our brain and then our brain is going to tell our muscles to do something. So the sensory input is going to come from the form of sensory neurons. So this is going to be sensory neurons. Then we have the integrating center, which is usually the brain, but it can be the spinal cord too. So put on brain and spinal cord. And then lastly, we have motor output. We have motor output. And this is going to be um, 
directions. Basically, actually, no, let's, let's make it a bit more science, scientific. Conscious or unconscious. I'll just put down subconscious. Conscious response. Meaning that you could be smelling something taste tastes good, and your brain will in, will interpret that. The subconscious part of it is that you'll begin to salivate. Maybe your heart rate will go up if you really are like, are excited about what's being cooked, and you're you're going to decide to get up and go get some food. Okay. So basically neurons are formed like, like this. So what we are, are gonna do is that we're gonna have something called afferent neurons. And these are neurons that feed information to the brain or the spinal cord. So brain, or also it could be the spinal cord. So this is called neuronal organization. Neuronal organization. And then it is going to go to what we call the efferent neurons. Efferent means exits. Or the efferent neurons. What's going to happen here is that the afferent neurons, these are going to be, as I said, they're going to be all sensory. And the efferent neurons are going to be all motor. Okay, now we use the process of what's called divergence and convergence. And we see convergence in the afferent pathway. And we see divergence in the efferent pathway. Because what happens here is that, for example, you have many sensory neurons that are, are going to meet in ganglia and they're going to diverge or come together into fewer and fewer neurons until there's only one going to the brain. This is called convergence. Now, when information leaves the brain, we have something called divergence. And what happens here is that now you have one source of information that's given to two, it's given to four, given to eight. So you, you see that it, that it keeps on going to more and more branches as, as, it, as it continues on. We call this divergence. Think of it as a, a bunch of lanes, like let's say you're on a freeway with five, with five lanes. They're doing construction, so they center you into one lane, and then it is going to separate into like five, five lanes again. It's basically what happens. And whenever convergence or divergence happens, it happens at sites of ganglia. Recall that I said that ganglia is where one, one neuron is, is going to, to go to that tunnel I was telling you about, and communicate with multiple neurons. So like this. So once again, this is divergence. And it's going to release information that's going to be taken by a bunch of different axons. And it goes, goes the opposite too. Okay, so now we're going to do once again a uh, a basic neuronal reflex, as I said. So we're going to have a stimulus, and a stimulus is anything that is going to prompt a response. A stimulus could be photoreceptors picking up light. It could be um, it could be mechanoreceptors de detecting pressure. So a stimulus is anything. That activates 
um, sensory neuron. So as you can tell, a lot of things. Now the afferent neuron, as I said, it is anything that is going to say sensory neuron that sends information to the brain or the, or the spinal cord. Um, now ganglia, as I already said, is those are our connections that are going to, 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 um, to either convert or diverse information. Now the efferent neuron, as I said, efferent neuron is going to be the motor neurons And then you have the target tissue, which is going to receive the, the, uh, receive the information. So it is the tissue that is, um, that is activated. So for example, it could be smooth muscle in your stomach. It could be skeletal muscle in your feet. It could be um, cardiac muscle in your, in your, in your heart. And then the response is how the muscle movement changes. So the response is basically what happens to the muscle. What happens to the muscle. And this is the basic neuron reflex arc. Okay. Now we already talked about the steps of neuronal transmission. So I'm not gonna go into that too much. But what I'm going to do now is talk about the physiology of neuronal communication. Of uh, neuronal communication. Okay, and I don't want to go into this too much because you already have a lot of stuff to go over. And you also have a lab practical to study for. But basically, there's three types of stimuli. Stimuli. We have either physical, We have visual, and we have chemical. To give you an example, um, a physical stimuli could be pressing on your, on your hand, pressing on your skin. Visual can be your photoreceptors picking up light, and chemical can be uh, particles being picked up by your, by your nose. Um, Taste and 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 uh, smell are 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 through chemicals. Physical includes even sound waves. So so for audio for hearing. Now, as we talked about with an action potential, there's something called a threshold level. Threshold level. Now, whenever there is a, a stimulus. It is going to begin the process of an action potential. So we have some units here, so minus 70, and we have um, minus 85, then we have zero, then plus 30. You are not sure this walk speed last lecture for chapter 10. Now this point here at zero, which is gonna be our baseline, this is called a threshold level. And what this means is that if the voltage inside the cell passes a certain point, then the, then the neuron will activate. We call it an impulse will fire. 
So basically, if the, the, if the neuron is, is activated to a point where it generates greater than zero millivolts, it's going to activate. So we call this an action potential. Because, the, because you are going to activate the neuron, you're, you're going to apply a stimulus that, of course, is going to depolarize the neuron, repolarize, and then back to baseline. However, there's something called a graded potential. And a graded potential is basically a false alarm. Graded potential. What this means is that the neuron is going to begin to depolarize, but it's not going to reach that threshold level. It's like a false alarm. So on a, so on a voltage meter, it would show up like this. So graded potential does not actually activate the neuron but it still does change the polarity of it a tiny bit. Like for example, if you press on your hands, you, are, well, you will generate a graded potential in your pain receptors, your nociceptors, but they're not going to fully activate. But if you really hit your hand, you're gonna go like, ah, oh, right? And that's because the stimulus was sufficient to activate the nociceptor. Now, basically, what happens with an action potential is that when it is fired, it needs to propagate. I spelled that wrong. Propagation of AP. Now what happens is that it's going to be generated actually in the cell body. It's going to be generated in the cell body. Okay. And so this is where the AP is going to be generated and it's going to actually travel down the axon as a wave. Then at the end, you're going to have release of neurotransmitters. So this is basically where the calcium channels open, uh, NT will be abbreviated for a neurotransmitter. So action potential fires, the electrical impulse is going to travel down the axon in a wave then at the end, it will release the neurotransmitter. Now, as far as stimulus strength goes, so action potentials are never more or less intense. What this, what this means is that they always are going to be fired the same. What determines though is what we call frequency. Frequency. Now, if the stimulus is very low, so if we have a weak stimulus, you might have, have action potentials fire like this. So here you have an action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential. And this will be interpreted as, okay, well, the neuron is being activated a little bit so we'll, we'll interpret that as a little pain response. Now, a powerful stimulus, powerful stimulus is the frequency is going to increase a lot. Action potential, action potential, action potential, action potential. And as they, as they keep on being generated, this is going to be interpreted as, wow, okay, this neuron is being activated a lot. So we're going to have to really really creates a powerful response. Okay, and that is going to be uh, our part on chapter 11.